inside. Oh, it's magnificent. The control room, believe it or not, was panelled with Italian marble. And not only that, anyone who worked in the control room had to wear felt overshoes so that they didn't mark the parquet flooring. The great machines and the humming away, making London power of piles and piles of money. <laughs> and so today, from all the power stations of Great Britain, flows out the current service. Powerful, obedient and clean. Battersea was the godfather of the modern power station. Generating large amounts of electricity to feed the grid and us. Today, the grid connects over 320 power stations spread across Britain. Like the pylons strung between them, they have become an integral part of our landscape. I think they're like the baobab trees, if you like, of England. They're like fat-bellied trees that you can imagine big men sitting under to debate the fate of the society. They seem to me very organically related to the English countryside. They don't seem strange or alien to me at all. Uh, and particularly the way in which, you know, on occasion you can see cloudscapes, the shadows of clouds moving across the face of the cooling towers. That seems to me very distinctive, very kind of moving in a way. I always remember the, the titles for the BBC Nationwide Current Affairs programme, which I remember watching as a child in the 60s, and you'd have these iconic images of contemporary Britain coming up, and one of the first of them was, power, was a power station with its cooling towers and with sheep grazing in front of it. And this was not an ugly thing, this was, uh, this was the actuality, but it was also aspirational in that way. Power stations and pylons speak to us of mass society. They speak to us of a population of 40, 50, 60 million. With us all switching on together, a new breed of man emerged. One who would grow to know the moment-by-moment -moment idiosyncrasies of Britain and the most personal habits of the British. At lunchtime, people like to be, roughly speaking, at about 16 degrees. Whereas in the evening, this temperature sort of rises to about 19 and a half degrees because of, at that time, if they're sitting watching TV, they'll feel the chill a bit more. Our relationship with the grid is an intimate one for a reason. Whenever we flick a switch, we expect it to work instantaneously, and this poses the grid with a fundamental challenge. The point about electricity is that unlike coal, which you can put in a pile, or gas, which you can put in a gas holder, you basically can't store it. So you have to generate electricity at the time it's being used. And that was why the national grid learnt to manage supply and demand in the system as a whole. If demand for electricity keeps on rising above supply, the result is power cuts. So the grid has to anticipate just what we're going to turn on next. The secret of grid control, as it is called, lies in working to a well thought out plan. We forecast demand up to seven years ahead when we're essentially looking at just economic factors, up to four hours ahead so that the control room can get onto a particular power station and say, you need to fire up, we'll need that power in four hours' time. And it's more than the British public that the demand forecasters have to deal with. It's also the British weather. Suppose you're in summer, midday, and the temperature suddenly drops by one degree centigrade then what's going to happen is demand's going to go up, heating's going to come on, and you're going to find probably that you need about a whole extra power station online to cope with that extra demand. And suddenly my job is on the line because I said the demand would be less than it is. 
the grid almost seems like a tangible expression of collectivity because it joins everybody's energy consumption to everybody else's because if you have a depletion in the system there, it has to be boosted up from over there. Remembrance Sunday is quite a large drop in demand and the biggest drop in demand ever was after the 9-11. So in, in September 2001 there was a, a three-minute silence as opposed to a two-minute silence and that was a very big drop in demand. They are uh, sort of index of reverence, if you like. It shows how much people are concerned about what's happened. But a daily preoccupation of the forecasters is to predict the size of the TV pickup, the surge in demand that happens at the end of a popular television programme. Not something I watch. No, it's eight till nine, so it's an hour long of something to do with the big build. All right. When a television programme finishes, it synchronises people's behaviour. They all get up, they get in the kitchen, and on goes those kettles. The TV pickup is, is a very British phenomenon because we have relatively few channels and we tend to be big tea drinkers. Um, we tend to boil water with kettles. Not everybody uses kettles to boil water. Some the Japanese use gas, for example. It may not just be kettles. It, they can open the fridge door to get out a, a quick snifty beer or something. Or rather more prosaically, they may all pop to the loo. And uh, when they flush away, all those water pumps come on, and that increases demand. I'd be very surprised if that went below 150. Our national TV moments can be tracked not just by viewing figures, but by how many megawatts we've used to recover from the experience afterwards. never been that good at penalties. We do rely on the great British public doing much the same every time in response to the same conditions. And they generally clearly repeat when they help us out. They don't let us down. They don't let us down. <laughs> in 1921, 600 million units were used by domestic consumers, mainly for lighting. By 1934, this figure had grown to nearly 4,000 million units. Electricity became widely used for cooking and heating. By 1939, the figure had reached well over 8,000 million units. But then Britain's now brightly lit cities were plunged back into darkness. Don't keep the door open, dear, because of the light. There were blackout curtains, and these had to be sealed, so not a chink was visible. I remember it in Blackpool, where it was pretty complete, and Blackpool, ironically, was the town of the illuminations. There weren't any illuminations, and one essentially groped one's way home. That's why the tram lines came in so handy, you know, you just had to follow them. I didn't mind even walking across Clapham Common. You could be accosted by a woman, but I just used to keep walking, you know. So down on the ground in wartime streets in Britain, there was a true darkness. <laughs> Up above, there was this extraordinary reverse of that situation, this great crisscrossing of lights, trying to illuminate the sky, trying to spot the aircraft that were trying to destroy us. Bombing had a profound impact on the grid because it changed where in the country electricity was needed. Get me southwest area control. You had the evacuation of children from city areas which would drop the load there. But what was far worse, munition factories were springing up like mushrooms well away from industrial areas and well away from any, anywhere where there was a grid. A crash construction programme extended the original grid to new areas of the country. Hundreds of miles were built. And the value of a linked-up system able to move power around Britain was established. In the war years, the grid really proved its worth. 
because when heavy air attacks knocked out Fulham Power Station in London and badly damaged Battersea, it was by means of the grid the power was brought in from South Wales and from Scotland to make all the difference. Day after day, night without cease, power for war and power for peace. The post-war electrical boom started almost immediately. In 1946, domestic sales of electricity increased by a third. It was the biggest rise ever recorded. One of the most popular purchases was an electric fire. And one design had an irresistible appeal to the British. Oh, yes, one, that, one of those magical fires, yes. Yeah. With the artificial coals on the top. But I was just going to say, they, they weren't... They were like a sort of plastic thing then. It wasn't like the coal effect you get today. No. No. We've got one. Uh, I, I, it, uh... <laughs> We keep thinking about something else, but we never get anything else. Yeah. For Miss Sins, I had a magic old fire. It was like two electric bulbs with spinners on the top. I loved them at the time, of course. It was the most modern thing there was at the time. Mm. But our love affair was to have a fatal consequence. In January 1947, Britain experienced the coldest winter since electricity supplies began. As consumption rose, the electric fire threatened to do what Hitler had failed to, bring the grid down. The electric fire somehow is a sort of, you know, a, it's a temptation, almost slightly you know, a little devil egging you on, but you know you mustn't burn all that electricity. Uh, your husband has a message for you, Mrs. Trissel. He says you've left the electric heater on in the hall and the gas fire on in the bedroom. Well, I don't want to go home to a cold house, do I? Mrs. Twistle, if everybody did the same as you, there wouldn't be enough heat to go round. The cold weather was exacerbating a fundamental problem. During the war, few power stations had been built. Britain was now facing post-war aspirations with little more generating capacity than we had in the 30s. At that time, I was based in Carlisle, headquarters of the Cumberland section of the grid. In 1947 winter, there were occasions when the situation was desperate and we actually had to open circuits uh, which were connected to the grid. If I cut off the supply at the high voltage substation, then the whole town would be cut off. Power cuts everywhere, power cuts all day. You weren't allowed to switch on between uh, nine in the morning and 12 and two in the afternoon and four, which for people who were relying on electric fires as their main form of heating, well, they might as well have sat out in the snow. About 15% of people couldn't work in factories because there was no power. Unemployment soared to two million as a temporary measure. It was a hopeless situation because after the war, people felt that things should be getting better. Here are some members of the new government. The Prime Minister and Sir Stafford Cripps. Mr Attlee's pipe is as constant as Mr Churchill's cigar. For Clement Attlee, there was only one answer. Nationalise the power stations and pour huge amounts of public money into a modernisation of the grid. In this age of designed economy, it'll surprise no one to hear that a vast plan for five years and beyond has been laid down by the Central Electricity Board.
it made sense to put the new power stations next to their fuel supply. The power map of Britain was redrawn, and the Midlands was king. Alongside the region's nationalised coal fields, a string of power stations were built. Stourbridge, Walsall, Donington, Staith, 